So I got a message this morning. I got to tell you that this message is going to be different than a lot of kind of messages. Most people f- pick a specific topic and uh, focus on that. And this is going to be a very broad, broad message that's going to, it's going to tell a whole a concept, but it's going to tell you a lot about the plan of God. You know, happens to be that my little baby Bella Boo's in the house this morning. I was thinking about her when I was writing this message, and the reason why is because she had a professor, her and Sierra both, Dr. Phipps. And, you know, some of the things she told me about Dr. Phipps, I was like, man, I could respect that. You know, he comes in there, he took no prisoners, he was merciless when it came to Catholic kids that came into his class. He tore down there <laughs> with their beliefs. <laughs> and I got to say that <clears throat> I'm not trying to necessarily commend him in that, but that's kind of like a big deal if you don't believe something's real and you, and you don't let other people's perceptions stop you from doing what you believe is the right thing to do. And so he was a history professor, and so you and I, we, all of us know, we've at least gone to junior high, right? And we went to, we had history classes, and we learned things that were contained within history books. And, but one thing that I would say that somebody like Dr. Phipps doesn't have, while he may understand some things that are written in history books, and one of the things I want you to know about the Bible, and I use this verse quite a bit, the Bible says that the natural mind cannot perceive the things of God because they're spiritually understood. So I need you to understand that this morning, that the person that is not born again of God. Now, I'll do my best at some point in time throughout this message, maybe multiple times, to explain what that even means. But if you haven't been born again, then you're, it's going to be difficult for you to understand much of what I'm trying to talk to you about this morning. Because, see, what the Bible teaches is that when a man is born again, what that means is, is that this is the Bible story. So if you're coming in here off the cuff, coming out here off the street, and you haven't heard much about the Word of God, it might be difficult to wrap your mind around some of these things, but that's why I've been praying for you this morning. I've been praying for you this morning that the Holy Spirit would open up blinded eyes and deafened ears and prepare the heart of man to be able to receive the truth of the gospel, because without the help of the Holy Spirit, you nor I will ever be able to understand. Amen. You know, I was, I can't even remember which song it was, but whatever the words were to the song, it had something to do with how grateful to know God, that God revealed himself. That's what I was getting out of the song. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, I'm so grateful that my life didn't look like many people that I knew growing up. And what I mean by that is, is that many times people grow up in the midst of a home or in an atmosphere where they kind of go through the motions. Their family raises them up a certain way. They go to certain schools. They get certain degrees, and then they they move on with certain careers and things of that nature. And, you know, I'm just going to be real with you. That's not my story, and I'm very grateful for that. You know, I can remember sitting outside of a convenience store. I've told the story before. I don't have anything to hide. I'm very proud of what God has done in my life. Uh, I'm proud of the Lord, amen, and to prove that he can do things, you know, um, because say, listen, if it had not been like this, I would have probably imagined in my own mind that I had accomplished something, but I can remember myself being outside of a convenience store waiting for somebody to drive up to get me high. I can remember being a high school dropout, and I can remember my whole life being worried about seeking the next high on smoking weed or drinking or whatever, and then God intervened in the midst of my life. And he revealed his truth about his son to me. And a person that had no hope just simply by faith would receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he would take me on a journey to now, you know, knowing that I went from being a high school dropout to having a master's in nursing to having a master's in theology. But the, but the truth is, is that it, none of that really means a whole lot if you don't have God. Because according to the story of the Bible... God is real, and God is in control of this earth, whether it doesn't seem like it or not. And that's a lot of what I want to talk to you about. So I'm grateful that God has allowed me to have a spiritual mind that can see things. And that's my prayer for you this morning, that you'd be able to see the spiritual of what I desire to talk to you about. So when it comes to history, you know, and I listen to this. I did a little trickery with with this word here. Salvation history, salvation his story. And that's, that's what I really want to talk to you about this morning because, see, mankind chronicles history in a lot of different ways. He chronicles history through the rise and fall of empires, through wars, 
through, through the way that people do hostile takeovers. And the history books are filled with skirmishes and battlefields and natural disasters. And so this is how mankind chronicles history through pandemics, the Spanish flu. Now COVID pandemic has changed the world as we know it. And if the Lord tarries, people will be talking about COVID and how it changed the world. And we don't have time to get into all the details of that. But nevertheless, that's how man chronicles history. But God chronicles history according to his word. And people would say, I get in conversations with people all the time, but that's not really God's word. That's men wrote that book. No, sir, I beg to differ with you. God wrote the word of God, and this is how God desires to communicate himself. And I've oftentimes, when I talk to atheists or whoever, I'm like, well, how would you propose, sir or ma'am, for God to communicate himself or reveal himself to you? Would you prefer that he just lobs a meteor on Putin over there in Russia? But that, you know, like I'm just saying, to reveal himself. But yet I talked to a guy that's from the Ukraine that's a believer, and he said, man, Ukraine's got the most corrupt government in the world. You don't know what to believe or what not to believe. We just sit here and we watch the news and we just soak all this stuff up. Mankind wants God to prove himself, but God says no, that faith is the substance of things hoped for with the evidence of things unseen. So God has communicated himself through his word and with the word of God, I explained it last week to you when I preached on the Bible itself. Its own testimony is that the word of God is theonoustos, theo God, noustos, breathe, breath, where we get the word pneumonia, where we get the word pneumatics, air. The breath of God that gave life to man, God allowed that breath of life to enter into man and through man would write the word of God upon paper and he would preserve that word to reveal truth to the human race. Now, if you're going to have a hard time believing that, you're probably going to have a hard time believing the majority of my message this morning, and that's why I've been praying for you. Amen? So let's go ahead and go to Galatians. And look, I started off saying we were going to just read uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, but I decided to back up, and we're going to start at verse 23, and I'm going to try to explain some of the things, these concepts as we move forward, and then we'll get into the message. Amen? Let's just pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we need your help. We need you to be the preacher and the teacher. We need you to give understanding and revelation and open up eyes, Lord God, because no matter how eloquent a person can try to speak or the concepts he tries to dissect, oh, Lord God, without your help, Lord, the human eye remains blind to your truth, Lord, and the human ear remains deaf to your truth. And so, Holy Spirit, we're asking you, Lord God, to reveal truth, Lord. I pray that this morning's message would be like seed scattered on fertile soil, Lord, and that it would produce a harvest in our life. It might not spring forth tomorrow, but Lord, I pray that it would spring forth life in the name of Jesus. Amen. So it says here, but before faith came, we were kept under the law. Now I want you to know that when it's talking about before faith came, it's talking about really the advent of Jesus. I want you to understand that there's a whole history of world history, of human history that took place before Jesus was ever born. And so that's what we're going to kind of like try to look into. We're going to try to look to see where the story of the Lord fits into the overall story of God on the earth and how that meets our real world where we live. So before faith came, we were kept under the law. We were shut up unto the faith. The idea of shut up, some translations call it prison. The idea is sometimes it's fish caught within a net, enclosed, meaning that there was a period of time whenever humanity was, was stuck in this place. God had humanity in a certain place until the day when Jesus would come, the day when it should afterwards be revealed. Where, wherefore, the law, look, this is the King James Version. I think I'm going go, go to a, a, I'm gonna go to a, a more... Um, a modern uh, literal translation. I'm going to use the NASB. Therefore, the law has become our tutor. The King James Version uses the word schoolmaster. The ESV uses the word guardian. The idea is kind of like a, a, a person that's hired out to take care of a child as they're being as they're growing up kind of like a a nanny on but not just any old kind of nanny we're talking about like an educated nanny you know what i'm saying like one that's got a college degree and is and is also tutoring the child bringing the child you know ra helping to raise the child up all right so god is saying that humanity the human race was held under the law for a period of time to, to act as a guardian and to bring mankind to the place when he 
was ready to give the world Jesus so that the world would then be ready to receive Jesus, which was his plan the whole time. But we'll get into that. To lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. I think it's important, and i, and I got to be careful and don't over-explain every little detail, but I think it's important that you understand what the word justified means. Now, the word justified literally means to be declared righteous by God. That means it doesn't matter what you feel like you are. Like many times people walk around under a cloud of guilt and condemnation and they don't feel worthy. But what I'm here to tell you this morning is that there's a place in the word of God where God will declare you as righteous. And the way that he does such a thing is that he allowed, according to the word of God, for your sin to be placed on Jesus. I don't know what you've done with this with Jesus thus far in your life, but I'm here to tell you the word of God says that God allowed your sin to be placed on Jesus. The great exchange took place where he took your guilt upon him. And when he died on the cross, he paid the debt of sin for you. And that then God allowed in his mind for the righteousness of Jesus to be transferred over to you when you believed by faith. But you have to be willing to believe by faith. You have to be willing. I said it last week and probably many times before that, that it's kind of like an ATM machine. Jesus has already paid the debt. You're free. There's an account waiting for you to receive your freedom and your liberty. All you got to do is punch in the PIN number. The PIN number is faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. But if you're driving down the road, you're like, I don't believe it. I don't believe that the account's full. I don't believe that that there's an inheritance waiting for me. I will never go through there, and I will never punch that PIN number in there, and I will never. Then guess what? You're going to remain with your pockets hanging out and empty pockets, spiritually speaking, you'll never receive what I believe. I understand this is one man's opinion based upon what God has done in his life. You will never be able to believe what God has done for the human race. But then he says, but now that faith has come, in other words, now that Jesus has come, the new covenant, we are no longer under a tutor or a guardian for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. Now, i got to tell you that, you know, you may not be woke this morning. I'm not talking about woke to the transgender agenda. I'm not talking about woke to racism. I'm talking about woke to Jesus. Because, see, the truth of the matter is, is that if you get woke to Jesus, you'll have your head right on all this other stuff. Okay, so when he says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female. No, there's, there's male or female. But in the mind of God, according to the, he's no respecter of persons. When you come to the Lord through the way that he has provided, which is the sending of his son, and you come by faith in God's mind, you just belong to him now. You're his children. You're the sons of the living God. That's what he's saying right there. Amen? You're all, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. I think that's important for you to understand who this guy Abraham is. I'll try to explain him in a little bit. But what I need you to understand is that before there was ever a nation called Israel, there was a man named Abraham. And he lived in southern Iraq. And God called him out of his father's house, and he promised to make a nation out of him. Now, you can do what you want with that. But the next time you're watching CNN or Fox News or whatever your little flavor is, and you see them talk about the nation of Israel, then you need to stop and you need to consider, wait, hold on a second. How did this little slither of land get planted in the midst of my modern world that I live within? And there's a whole history behind Israel that I was never taught about in world history when I was in the 6th, 7th, or 8th grade, or whenever I went on to college, when I was in Dr. Phipps class. Why did we not talk about Israel more? Why did we not talk about King David? Why did we not talk about the fact that God had a plan, God had a nation that he created, and that it showed up out of nowhere? Going into chapter 4. Now I say as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. You know what that means? That means until Jesus came, humanity did not understand how to become a child of God, and only the nation of Israel under Abraham's descendants were the sons of God. And that really and truly, everybody else was kind of like a servant, waiting for the time. 
See, just as a son, he sa- it says in the scripture here, a son is no different than a servant until he comes of age. Meaning, if I'm an eight-year-old boy and my daddy's a multimillionaire, and then there's another boy who is a child of the servant that lives in the house, me and him ain't that different. Yeah, I got some different favor, but I'm not able to walk in the inheritance that belongs to me because I'm not of proper age. I'm not of proper maturity to be able to receive the things of God and to be able to walk into the things of God. I hope that makes some sense. This is kind of some deep stuff here. He's no different than a slave, although he is owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So the law was similar in that sense. Does that make sense? It was, it was serving as a manager or a guardian until the time of Jesus. So also we, while we were children, look at this, I want you to see this, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Before we transition into verse 4, I want to try to take a little moment with verse 3. We all, while we were children, meaning the human race, okay, if you could look at it, look, we use this word in medicine called maturation, the process of development. You start off as a little baby, and then you mature, and you, you go through the process of maturation where you grow, you grow in size, but you also grow in intellect, and you grow in development, okay? The idea behind this passage of Scripture that I'm reading to you is that the human race is like a, is like a human being. All of us collectively are like a human being. We're starting off as a child and we're going through the mature. As the time frames of human history are moving forward, God is maturing the human race and we're becoming more aware of the things of God because God is revealing himself to mankind through these processes. Does that make sense? And so whenever humanity was like in the childhood stage, we were under the elements of the world. Now that word elemental things of the world, uh, in the King James it says elementary principles. The idea is the first things, the first order of things, okay? So for the Jewish people, that was the law, But I need you to understand that the nation of Israel, this is going to be important for us to get into this in a moment, the nation of Israel exists within a much larger whole, meaning the rest of the world is what we call Gentile nations. Whether they be in Europe, whether they be in Asia, whether they be in South America, if they're not Israel, then they're considered, according to the Bible, Gentile nations. These were nations that did not know the God of Abraham, but instead were under Other leadership and authority, we're going to get into that in a moment. You came to the wrong service if you don't believe in the supernatural realm, if you don't believe in the spiritual aspects of the Bible, because we're about to get into it, and I'm just going to let it flow. But what I need you to know is is that that during this time frame, mankind was held in bondage to these elementary principles, meaning Again, for the nation of Israel, the law, the old covenant, but for these other Gentile nations, listen, they had false gods, demonic powers, evil, wickedness. You know, listen, this is kind of funny, but I love this. Whenever my girls were young, we used to to watch Cars. I remember taking them to see that movie Cars in the movie theater, dude. I used to, one time Robert's like, dude, what's up with Tomator on your car, man? Dude, I love me some Tomator. He's so much cooler than Lightning McQueen. He'd be like, I'm the best backwards driver in the whole wide world. And then he'd say this, I don't need to know where I'm going because I know where I've been. There's some power in that because, you see, if you really know where you came from, then you're going to be able to see where we're going. The problem that most of us in this world have is that we don't know where we've been. We don't know where the world really was. We're taking information that mankind or humanity is telling us. We buy into these certain news sources and we watch these news sources over and over again and we receive our history from the books instead of the book. And so what I need you to know is is that these other foreign entities, these nations, these countries that did not know the God of Israel, they were worshiping false gods. And we're going to get into that in a moment. And that kind of stuff is still going on today. Okay, listen, you came into the house of the Lord this morning and you just got a different preacher this morning. But look, whenever you heard all that stuff on the news about Jeffrey Epstein, 
Okay, you, raise your hand if you heard about the Jeffrey Epstein stuff, right? And you heard about all the pedophilia stuff, correct? Right. Now, how many of you have heard, and you don't even have to raise your hand if it's going to make you feel weird, that it was actually deeper than that? And that really the pedophilia was deeper than that? Uh Uh-oh, come on now. I see some of y'all shaking y'all's heads, some of you people I don't even know. And so what was it supposedly deeper in? Was it deeper in the the occultic world? Was there a purpose and a reason why they were doing all this weird stuff to these kids? And you remember, you ever, whether you like Trump or not, I don't know if you like Trump. I don't really care if you like Trump. I'm not here to have a political, I like Trump too. I think he's funny. I like the way he gets people stirred up. But anyway, um, with all that said and done, did y'all remember, I think her name might have been Katie Couric. I'm kind of going off the cuff here. She was a blonde-headed woman. There was a little town hall meeting. He's sitting there talking. Do you believe that the Democrats, party is behind an occultic agenda of child sacrifice and all. She straight up asked him that on national TV. Yeah. And so, so the question is, and I, I don't necessarily even think it's just the Democratic Party. I just want you to understand that. I'm not a party person. I don't trust the Republicans anymore than I trust the Democrats. But what I'm trying to say is this. I'm trying to paint a picture for you that the world that you live within They got a whole different historical context that you may not know anything about, but just because you don't know about it, just because you're ignorant about it, doesn't mean that it's not true. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that there's not an occultic world out there that's doing some really, really weird stuff in order to gain power from spiritual entities in order to bring forth a plan upon the earth that is the opposite of God's plan. Whenever I first started digging into this stuff, and I've shared this before, uh, and I walked into the old church that I used to go to, and I can remember talking to my girls. I'm like, dude, the Lord showed me something about pyramids, about the Tower of Babel. And we'll talk about that a little bit this morning too. And then the next thing you know, I see pyramids everywhere. SpongeBob's got pyramids. And then one day I walked into the church and I'm like, dude, why is that pyramid on the dollar bill? Like 40 something years old and been looking at dollar bills all of my life. And now all of a sudden, boom, why is this pyramid on the dollar? Don't, don't even look at me like I'm stupid. Go back and do the research yourself. The vice president that was with whoever it was, Eisenhower, Roosevelt at the time was a 32nd degree Mason. That pyramid's got little bricks. What do Masons do? They lay bricks. And at the top of it, it got an eye and it's not the eye of God. God in God we trust what God? It's not the God of the, of the Jews that sent Jesus. No, it's not him. It's the all-seeing eye. It's the eye of Horus. I didn't even plan on getting into all that, but look, let's set the context. The nations of the world worship after false gods. There's an occultic world and an occultic agenda that has been taking place upon this earth for thousands of human years. And the agenda and the occult plan is to bring forth a New world order, just like it was at Babel, so it is today. You do your own research. I, I, listen, I'm not here to convince you of something. You do your own research. You can think I'm crazy. It's a convenient thing for you to think the preacher's crazy. Just, just go ahead and blow it up. But I challenge you, I dare you to do your own research. I dare you to go down that pathway and to start digging around. And then you will learn how real God is. See, if you didn't want to believe the preacher when he came in here singing to Jesus and talking about how the Lord found him outside the triple quick and instead of getting high, he got saved, hallelujah. If you didn't want to come hear that, then look, go study the other stuff and guess what it'll do? It'll lead you around about in another way back to the same place. Why is all of this stuff going on on the earth? Why is there so much wickedness? Because they're trying to move humanity away from God. Sorry, science, amen, the Lord's worthy. I'm sorry, science is going to have to catch up with my God and his word. History is going to have to catch up with my God and his word. Because the natural mind cannot perceive the things of God because they are spiritually understood. Praise God, I believe that. And it's okay if you don't like me now, (laughs) but I do believe that. Now, here we go, right here, verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, now let me read it right. When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born 
under law. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you, Lord God, for your word. Pray, Lord, that you would open up the scriptures and that you would allow us to see Holy Spirit have your way with our hearts. Amen. So salvation is his story. So what I'm trying to say is, is that we're looking at the Bible as a historical document this morning, okay? We're looking at the Bible and we're trying to learn what does God say about the world that we live within? What does God say about our lives and what's the important point of our lives? <laughs> when I say that, Many of you already know much of what uh, things that I say many times. Can we not all agree that we're all looking for something? Yeah, like, really, I mean, b before we give our heart to the Lord, I'm just trying, even after we give our heart to the Lord, because, look, you'll run into people like, yeah, I tried that Jesus stuff. Or I tried that Jesus stuff, and I used to go to church until such and such in the church did such and such to me. And then now I don't go to church anymore. Well, that was your problem, my friend. You started looking at people in the church instead of looking at the one who produced the church and bought it with his blood. His name is Jesus. He'll never let you down. Amen. Now, the problem is, is many times we live our life looking for what we want, trying to fill that void in our heart and in our lives, searching and plugging along, trying to look for success, trying to look for something. We think that, I'm just saying, like, listen, the Bible says a man that finds a wife finds a good thing, but then we think we're going to find a wife, and then, oh, that, now I'm happy. Or we're going to have children. Okay, you can have two, three, four, five, six children, and you still, if that's all you're looking for, you still, okay, well, if I build my house, and I know y'all know I make fun of it, but you know, if I build my house and I put my crown mold and I get my leather couches, or if I upgrade my vehicle and I can smell fresh leather, or if I get a certain amount in my checking account and I got a certain amount in my 401k, now I finally have looked for, found the thing that, that felt like it was a little, no, 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 you just keep on searching, my friend, and guess what? Whenever you're 55, 60, 65, and you've still been searching, come back and talk to me if I'm still around. And then, and then I'll try to bring you back to Jesus. I'm, I'm preaching to myself this morning. Because if you think that I'm not ever enticed trying to, trying to figure something out, but, but the Lord keeps reminding me, where are you going, son? You, you already know what the answer is. You got, you got inside information that other people are still searching for. So I want you to know that that empty spot that you feel on the inside of your life, that you're ever trying to put something in there, his name is Jesus. God sent him to die for you, amen, so that you could have a relationship. So salvation is his story. So the Bible is taught to teach us salvation history, amen? And so here we go, verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. There's a whole lot to be said there, but let's just keep moving. Salvation, his story, is broken up in two separate sections. It's got the Old Testament and the New Testament in it. It's broken in half, and we're going to go ahead and kind of consider that. Now listen, with the book of Genesis, I put Genesis there instead of creation because, and I don't want to get into this too much because I don't believe that the Bible is a scientific book, but I do believe that the Bible has science. One of the beautiful things to me when I when I learn about creation or when I read about creation, because I'm a creation believer. Listen to me. All you got to do, if you just even do a little bit of study about the Krebs cycle, the very guy that taught me about the Krebs cycle in anatomy and physiology in nursing school was an atheist. When you come to the conclusion that you put glucose in the tank and that it produces energy through phosphorylation and the cleaving off of carbon atoms and the end result is water and carbon dioxide and this human body is functioning at the cellular level like that, I'm sorry, even scientists, they don't want to admit God is real, but they're coming to the reality of intelligent design. They don't want to tell their friends because they'll be ostracized. But I'm here to tell you, that stuff don't come together just by some kind of sludge bumping together out of nowhere. No, God has put his imprint in creation. And if, hallelujah, and if you look back at the, in the beginning, what you're going to begin to see is, is that he never created man or animals until he had first created light, let there be light, till he had first created water, till he first created soil, and then he said, let every seed reproduce according to its own kind. He never produced human beings or animal life until he first produced vegetation because none of those things could continue to exist because without photosynthesis, Synthesis, you can't have vegetation. Without vegetation, you can't have carnival, you can't have animals because they have to have something to eat. 
So God created a place, and when you look at it in the end, he says, on the sixth day, he created man. He created man, and he said, let him have dominion over the earth. So what I learned from my Bible when I studied creation is that God created this rock we call earth for one purpose, for man to live with on it, to live on it, for man to reproduce on it, for man to reproduce according to his own kind. Because if you look at it from the perspective of God, God wanted a family. God wants an eternal family. And God created you with a free will. Well, he didn't create a bunch of robots. No, he created you with a free will to give you the opportunity that you will either say yes or you will reject the God of glory. And all along through salvation history, he has been revealing himself to humanity. Now, when he first created Adam and Eve, according to the word of the Lord, that he created them in his own image, in his own likeness, and that there was no sin, and that everything that he created was perfect in all of its ways, or it was good. He said it is good. Amen? But then sin, see, that's the next thing, the fall. Sin came into the human race. And I want you to understand that the fall or sin, when it came into the human race, it changed everything. Every time you find yourself lying in bed at night and crying tears because of your, it, whether you be lonely, whether you lo lose a loved one, whether something happens to you at work, whether something's happening to your child, whatever the case that you might be going through and you feel the heartache and the burden and the heaviness in your life, I can tell you right now that the genesis of that is the fall of mankind. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that all creation groans and waits for the, well, let me just say it like this, the completion of the sons of man, meaning that when God brings it all to an end, even creation will be restored to its natural, to its first state. That's what the word of God says, that the world is in flux, it's in chaos. You ought to be able to see that. There, there, there is a chaotic feel to the earth that we live on. Amen? Can we not say that? Anybody, listen, you may not know it, but you just come visit at the ER for a couple of hours, and you will see the chaos that, that is in. And listen, if we're not careful as health care providers, I'm just telling you, we'll, be, we'll, we'll start thinking all special about ourselves. Look at me, man. I've arrived. Thank God my life's not like that. Well, guess what? That was my life, my friend. I know who changed me. I know who set me free. Don't tell me that God can't bring people out of that. But what I'm trying to say is, is that people's lives are full of chaos, and it's because of the fall. That God originally created mankind in his own image and likeness, but the fall has contorted and caused chaos, and it has twisted everything up. But I need you to understand that God has a plan. And listen, he can't allow you to have a free will if there's not a real choice to be made. So within all of this, there's the choice of evil that you, that you see around you each and every day. Opportunities and choices to go the wrong way. And when man went the wrong way, the Bible says of Adam's son, Seth, that he was born in the image and likeness of his father, Adam. We were no longer operating in the image and likeness of God without sin, but instead we became like our father, Adam. If I could say it like this, the fall of man caused us to receive from Adam an unsavory DNA, a genetic I know it's not really like that, but spiritually a genetic malformation on the inside of our spiritual DNA that we're born like our father, Adam. We're born in a fallen state. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. Amen. And one of the beautiful things about the gospel is, is that, you know, even if you hear me talk about sin or you hear me talk about the cross or you hear me talk about blood and it makes you feel uncomfortable, what you need to understand is, is that I'm not the kind of preacher that's preaching down to you. I'm the kind of preacher that's letting you know we all in the same boat, my friend, and that's why Jesus had to die. Amen. Amen. So from Genesis to the fall and then to the flood. Now, i got to tell you that there's a lot of weird stuff that's happening before the flood. You need to go back and you need to do your own research to see whether or not you can prove from other. But you, but you got to understand, if you're looking for sources that want to discount the validity of Scripture or the truth of the Bible, then all you're going to find is sources that renounce the truth of the Bible. Yet, if you're looking for sources that will, that will build up the truth of the Bible, then you will find them. And if you will believe in your heart, then guess what? God will allow your eyes to be open. But I want you to understand that the Bible teaches us that a lot of strange things were taking place during the time before the flood, much like today. 
So what I need you to understand is, is that whether or not you can understand it, whether or not I can understand it, y'all are all grown ups and y'all know some weird stuff is going on on the earth today. And I need you to understand the Bible teaches that fallen angels came to earth and had relationships with daughters of men and produced something on the earth called Nephilim, which were giants, which were evil entities that were leading mankind in the wrong way. Now, you can do whatever you want with that. But what, I'm trying to, what I want to try to make you think is, is that in your mind you imagine some angel floating down with wings. But what I want you to understand is this, is that imagine an entity that's smarter than any human being you've ever known. Imagine an entity that understands genetic engineering long before modern man ever understood it. If you need just one little glimpse of human history, I'll tell you what, if you, can, if you got a good memory, you just remember this name and you go home and you research it yourself. Jack Whiteside Parsons in the beginnings of NASA and the occult connection. You go ahead, you put that in your phone and you go do your research and come back and see me in a few months. Because what you will learn is that as a student of Aleister Crowley, Jack Whiteside Parsons, who never graduated from college, what became a rocket scientist that, de that developed liquid rocket fuel technology, and in his living room, JPL Laboratories later became NASA, and a German rocket scientist admitted all of that. What is your purpose? Because he claims he got his information from fallen angels through doing occult magic. So the point that I'm trying to make to you is this, is that these things that the Bible testifies about have literally happened according to the testimony of human beings that have been on the face of the earth. This might mess up your worldview, but I'm here to tell you that the, that the word of God has these truths in it. And that's why people like Jeffrey Epstein and all these other people are engaging in all of this weird occultic uh, things that are going on because they receive, they believe that they receive from demonic entities revelation on how to accomplish the things that they desire to accomplish on the earth. And you and I are collateral damage. We're just down here watching Fox News and CNN fight with each other, a little puppet show, and there's all this big stuff going on up here. And, and, and listen, it's a mess. There's all kind of lies out there. They were causing confusion, and the only one true thing on the earth, in my opinion, is Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. So after the flood, there's this thing called the Tower of Babel. I've done a lot of research on these things because the Lord showed me that it was important that I understand Babel. Some of the things I learned about the Tower of Babel, most scholars and commentators believe that the Tower of Babel was in southern Iraq and uh, actually, Alexander the Great. They found archaeologically that Alexander the Great mentioned it. He mentioned the great edifice that was built by, you know, in the early days and then also reconstructed under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. So what I'm trying to tell you is that there's archaeological evidence that people saw and believed that the Tower of Babel was there. Now, whenever you look also in other places, there's the pyramids of Giza. There are pyramids and ziggurats in South America. There's these structures that are all over the earth. And then I also mentioned to you that there's this weird little pyramid on the back of our dollar bill. And within all of these things that are taking place, what I learned about the Tower of Babel, it says, let us build ourselves a tower that reaches into the heavens and let us build a name for ourselves. And then God comes down and he confuses their languages. And the first question that I had was, why would God be so stressed out about ancient man baking brittle bricks and making some tower that's not going to be able to really reach into the atmosphere any more than a skyscraper? But what I realized is, is that these people were performing occult magic and that they were engaging in entering into this spiritual realm to receive these spiritual understandings in order to bring the plans of the enemy forward. Whether or not you believe, listen, this is another thing you need to Google. You want real-time stuff? Google how many United States presidents have talked about a new world order. Joe Biden did it just the other day. But before him, it was Obama. Before him, it was George Jr. And before him, it was his daddy. And before him, it was another. And they've constantly been talking about a, war, a new world order. And not only that, they talk about also the fact that George H. Bush made the comment that there will be a day whenever there will be an international police force and we will offer our sovereignty to them. We will submit ourselves to this international police force. 
Now, I mean, it's just a little blip on the radar. Nobody catches it. People just forget about it. He said it how many 20-something years ago. Why are they saying these things? Why would a president of the United States say these things if there's no validity to it? What is going on? We got we to gotta wake up from our slumber. We got to open up our eyes, and we got to begin to realize that something is going on on this earth. Amen. And that God is real. Hallelujah, and that he sent his son Jesus. And so at the Tower of Babel, God had told these human beings after the flood to repopulate the earth, and instead they said, no, we're coming together as one, one world order. We're coming together as one, and God said he went down there and he confused their languages. And through the confusion of their languages, he caused the the people groups to be divided, and they began to migrate over the face of the earth. And each one of them taking with them their own narrative. Now, listen, this is where it gets really interesting because in the Bible itself, it teaches you got to find it in Deuteronomy, you got to find it in Psalms, you got to find it in the book of Daniel. But the Bible teaches that God allowed these nations to be placed spiritually under the authority of fallen angels. Why? Why would God do such a thing? Because at the Tower of Babel, they were worshiping fallen angels. It's kind of like whenever the people said, we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. God said, you don't want me to be your king. Okay, fine, I'll give you another king. And in a similar fashion, at Babel, they were worshiping false gods. And God said, you want to worship false gods. I'll let them be your God. I'll let them lead you and guide you. But then in the next chapter, after he puts those nations under the leadership of these fallen angels, you turn to page, God calls a man named Abraham and says, come out of your father's house, hallelujah, and I will make you a nation. I will make you a nation. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And through your seed, Abraham, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. The apostle Paul, thousands of years later in the book of Galatians would write, he didn't say seeds, plural. He said seed one, his name is Jesus. The seed of Abraham, I'm getting ahead of myself, was Jesus. So after the Tower of Babel, all of these nations are being separated out. Guess what? God creates his own nation. God creates his own nation and places them on earth. You you ought to be excited about this. The Bible's telling you about something that has answers to things that are going on on the earth today. After Babel, again, Abraham, he made a great nation out of Abraham. Now, listen, I went ahead and I shifted gears on you right here because, look, I'm breaking this down. We're going to make it quick, though. Abraham had a son named Isaac. You see that? Isaac had a son named Jacob. And, look, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. If you didn't know that, I just covered about 40 chapters for you right there. God God said, Abraham, come out of your father's house. I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. And in a wrestling match with God, when he was running from his brother Esau, God touched his hip and changed his name from Jacob, deceiver, to Israel, prince of God, one who rules with God. And what I need you to understand is that the, the word name in the Bible describes character. And it, it describes nature. I need you to understand that whenever you give your heart to the Lord, he wants to change your nature. He wants to change your character. He wants to do a spiritual work on the inside of you. And here's Israel, and he has these 12 sons. You see them? Reuben. See these first six? They were all born of Leah, his first wife. Reuben, Simeon, Levi. Judah is where Jesus came from. Issachar, Zebulon. And then, and then the, the two handmaids of Rachel, Dan and Naphtali, the two handmaids of Leah, Gad, and Asher, and then Rachel's two boys, Joseph and Benjamin. These are the 12 tribes of Israel. When you hear about Israel, when you hear about Jacob, when you hear about, the, this is how the nation began from one man named Abraham. Again, watch CNN or Fox News tonight, and they'll talk about Israel. Whatever your flavor is, and you need to understand that the Bible has a story about how this all started. Abraham's about 2000 BC, and then from there is the Exodus. You remember the story of the Exodus? See, after the 12 tribes, after the 12 sons were there, they began to multiply. There was a famine in the land. They went to Egypt, and if you'll remember, with time, they became slaves in Egypt. That's what the Bible teaches. 
I was reading, watching a, a, a video the other day of an archaeologist, and he was talking about how the wanderings, that they have found evidences of Israel wandering in the wilderness. It's not, you know, mankind wants to say that none of this could be true. But anyway, nevertheless, God, God allowed Israel to leave through the exodus. Amen. And then God brought them into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. I'm just trying to give you a context to understand in the Old Testament that God has a plan. I want you to understand that God has been moving in the midst of human history. And one of the things that I have learned through the years is that the way that history was taught to me in little bits and pieces, whether I was learning about the Babylonian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, now I understand why none of it really made sense. Now I understand why the pieces of the puzzle were never able to come together because we were never told the story from God's perspective. And God is the one that brings meaning to the whole thing. God is the one that allows it all to come together. And so under the leadership of Joshua, God brings the children of Israel into the promised land, which is that little slither of land that's now on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea that they still fight over today. God allowed his people from the wilderness to enter into that promised land, and then we move into the time frame of the kings. The time frame of the kings is after Israel begins to have all these kings. I'm not going to spend too much time on here. But at the same time, see, the, the, the problem with the, with, during the time frame of the kings is that, again, you got to understand that Israel is a nation that has the light of God with them. Does that make sense? God said, I'm going to give you my word, and you're going to be light in the midst of darkness. God has always had a people on the earth to be a witness for him. Many times God's people aren't the kind of witness he would prefer they be. But nevertheless, God has always had a witness in the land. Amen. And always a mouthpiece and a voice to speak to make people aware that God is real. And God had a people called Israel. But during the time frame of the kings, the people of God wanted to be like the world around them. you know, neutral. There's none of that. You can't divide people up, those that like to run marathons, those that don't. Those that like to go to the gym, those that don't. Those that like to shop at Dillard's and those that like Alta or whatever Alta is. I don't even know what Alta is. <laughs> Heard somebody talking about it the other day. That's not how we divide mankind. In the mind of God, you, are, we, you and I are divided as you either are awake to God or you're still sleeping. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And many times, many of the people that are supposed to be awake to God ain't really awake to the Lord. Is it okay just to speak the truth? I hope I haven't gotten on your nerves too bad yet. Is it okay just to speak the truth? God's people are supposed to be awake, but when God's people want to start looking like the world around them, living like the world around them, they got this, they do that. I want to be like that instead of like God says, then a problem starts to enter in. Yes, sir. We, start, we start compromising in our walk and in our life where the word of God says we're supposed to be separate yeah. from the world around us. And so God would send the prophets Amen? God would send the prophets, and he, and, and he would warn his own people to come back to him, to forsake the ways of the world, and instead to embrace the ways of God. And so that's basically how it shakes out in the Old Testament. But look, after the time frame of the kings, I know y'all are getting tired already, but look, we, look it's, not even, it's not even 11 o'clock yet. After the time frame of the kings, I need you to understand something happened to the nation of Israel. God, through the prophets, warned them that if they did not correct their direction, that bad things were going to start to happen to them. Have you ever seen God correct you in a certain way, and then you didn't listen, and then stuff started happening? I don't know about you, but I've seen it. And so Daniel, Daniel prophesies about these nations, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. 
Daniel prophesies about all of these. These are historical empires that took place within the time frame of human history. And guess what? Israel took place right there in the midst of them. Because they didn't listen to the prophets, Israel found themselves in bondage under these nations. And it spread probably for at least five, six hundred years, Israel lived under the bondage of these nations. Now, a couple of things that I want you to know is about 586 B.C. is when that started. But look, the time frame of Rome is whenever Jesus is born and brought upon the earth. Does that make sense? Two things that I wanted you to see, though, when it comes to Greece and Rome. See, to me, this is interesting stuff. You, I might have already bored you to death, and you might be ready to take a nap. But to me, this is interesting because, look, some of the things I've learned about human history is that Greece provided a new language for the civilized world. What I'm trying to tell you is that during the Roman Empire, the whole world spoke Greek. The New Testament is written in Greek. God was preparing the world in the fullness of time is our scripture. In the fullness of time, Jesus was born of a woman, born under law. What did Rome provide? Rome provided roads. You ever, you ever read that before? The Roman road, all lo roads lead to Rome. That's what Rome provided, a transportation system, safety within the empire, C citizens and, and even other nations that were willing to, to, give their, to get, pay their honor and homage to Rome were protected. God prepared the world for such a time as this. See, we look at all the moving and the big movers and shakers on the earth and we see all the big things that are taking place on the earth and we imagine in our mind that unless it's big and bright and shiny that it can't be of the Lord. But I'm here to tell you that in the midst of all of this was the fullness of time and God sent Jesus. A little obscure nation called Israel that was under bondage to Rome and in the midst of that, God allowed the, his only begotten son to be born of woman, to be born under law in the fullness of time as he prepared the world to receive Jesus. And so here we have Jesus in the New Testament. Amen. Jesus in the cross. See, whenever you're talking about Jesus, you can't just talk about Jesus, the miracle worker, and you can't just talk about Jesus, the great teacher. But instead, you have to understand that the purpose of Jesus was that he would be born. He would be born of a woman. He would be born of the virgin. He would come upon the earth in sinless human flesh to pay the penalty for the sins of mankind. Why? Because Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. Adam had no sin. And then when Adam sinned, all the offspring of Adam were now sinners. And so the Bible teaches that, so that, that means that you couldn't die for your own sin. I know I've told the story before, but one time I was talking to this Muslim lady. And, and, and we were sitting there talking and, and I just said, look, I said, look, this is the thing. We both know that one of us, can't, one of us is wrong. <laughs> like, we, we can't both be right. Because you're over here preaching Allah and Muhammad, and I'm preaching Jesus. So one of us is wrong. She said, yes. I said, this is the only thing I'm going to leave you with. Okay, and, and you, get, you, you, you pray, and you ask God to reveal to you. But see, there's a commentary called the Hadith that Muhammad wrote, and it talked about something out of the Koran. And this is what Muhammad said. He said, with one drop of the martyr's blood, all his sin is atoned. And I told that lady, I said, that's a problem. Because, see, the martyr's blood is tainted with sin. Ma'am, your blood is tainted with sin. My blood is tainted with sin. The blood of every human being upon the face of the earth is tainted with sin. That's why Jesus had to come in the flesh. Amen. That's why Jesus had to come, born of a virgin, born of incorruptible seed, impregnated by the Holy Spirit, as wild as that is for you to wrap your mind around. The natural mind cannot perceive the things of God because they are spiritually understood. God overshadowed that young virgin girl, and she gave birth to the Lamb of God, the Messiah that was promised to the nation of Israel for one purpose. Listen, when they came, the wise men found him wrapped in swaddling clothes or by that 
time he was a child. What did they bring? Frankincense, myrrh, and gold. He was the king. He was the priest. Myrrh they used to embalm dead bodies. Even in his birth, it was prophesied that he would die. See, you can't have just the good teacher and the miracle worker. That's another thing some, a Muslim guy told me one time when I was witnessing to a Muslim guy. I said, he said, well, we believe in Jesus. I said, oh, really? Okay. He said, yes, we believe in Jesus. He was a great prophet. I said, no, sir, that's not going to work. Because look, and I said, I know the people don't like me. That's okay. You don't have to like me. But look, I don't need you to be on my team here, and I'm not trying to be rude. But look, you can't say Jesus is a great prophet. You can't say that, sir. Well, what are you talking about? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Now, Jesus is either crazy, he's a liar, or he's the Son of God, he's the Messiah, he's the Christ, he's the anointed one that God sent to die for the sins of mankind. He either is or he isn't. There's no in-between. You know how they trick that? Slick and tricky. You got to watch people. They say, oh, it wasn't the real Jesus that died on the cross. It was a different Jesus. Oh, yeah, that's what they say. You ask them, what do you think about Jesus? And they'll tell you, oh, he's a great prophet. Okay, but not. But what do you think will happen on the cross? There was a switch and bait. That's what they say. That the nature of the real Jesus was removed and then another another Jesus was. Anyway. They'll try to denigrate the cross. Even churches nowadays don't want to talk about the cross. Churches don't want to talk about the blood. Churches don't want to talk about sin because they're scared it's going to make people uncomfortable. And they're scared that people aren't going to want to come back to church. And so the preacher's more worried about the offering basket than he is the souls of human beings that might walk through the doors of his church. I just believe God for a day whenever there'd be a church of people that would desire to hear the truth of the gospel and let it marinate on the inside of their heart and let it change them. Hallelujah. Let it be the piece of the puzzle of that empty spot that they've been trying to fill up and that they would understand. Hey, listen, we're not where we need to be, but thank God we ain't where we used to be. Thank God the Lord has revealed himself to us. Praise God. So from Jesus to the cross, but look, this is supposed to be the word Pentecost right there. It's too, too big. Pente, five. Pente, 50. 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits in the New Testament, the Spirit of God descended in the upper room. That's what the Bible teaches. Spirit of God descended in the upper room, cloven tongues of fire laid upon all of their heads. They began to speak in other tongues. People get caught up in the whole tongues thing and they start freaking out. But the main point that you need to understand is this. There's a purpose for the power. Jesus said, you will tarry in Jerusalem. You will wait for the gift of my Father, the promise of my Father. You will be endued with power from on high, and you will become witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for the power of God to be on the inside of you so that you can be a witness for God. Now, I need you to understand, let's go back to Greece and Rome. Greece, the whole world of the known world, civilized world, spoke Greek at the time Alexander the Great spread the the, the Grecian language through Hellenism. Rome built roads and protected citizens. In the fullness of time, hallelujah, God sent forth his son. In that time frame, chronologically, when the world was prepared, then Jesus dies on the cross, he resurrects from the dead, He ascends to the Father, and the Holy Spirit descends in the upper room. And the people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And guess what? Now they're on fire for the Lord, and they're walking on Roman roads, and they're speaking the Greek language, and they're speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. What a beautiful thing. I know I get excited, but what a beautiful thing when the Apostle Paul went to Athens. Remember I preached on that a couple of months ago? The Apostle Paul went to Athens, and he was walking down that pathway to Mars Hill. It's a place you can still go visit it today. And there were gods that lined both sides of the street. And there was even one god on this, and the inscription said, to the unknown god. And the Apostle Paul gets up on Mars Hill. as a big old rock. You can Google it later if you want. People still go there today to look where the philosophers would go. They'd get up there, and they would just speak about all their philosophy, all their intellect. The Apostle Paul says, I find that you're a very superstitious people. You have all these gods. And you're so scared you're going to miss a god. 
and you're going to offend him, and you live in fear that you're not going to give him glory, that you even wrote an inscription to the unknown, God, well, it's him I want to talk to you about. His name is Jesus. God sent Jesus to die on the cross. And God would say, and he said this, Apostle Paul said this in his message, God would or wishes that people, and in the King James it uses the word grope. I know that's a weird word, grope. The the meaning of the word is to feel around. It's like people are blind and they're feeling. You remember I told you whenever I preached that message, when I was in survival school in Europe, and when they stuck us in the bottom of a ship and they lit a fire and they put it out and you couldn't see anything because it was black. And you had to learn this thing called ergonomics and you'd have to walk. And you'd put your foot out in front of you and you had to do like this so that you didn't bump into walls. As they, and they would have somebody screaming and you had to try to find your way to try to save the person. That's the idea of groping or feeling around looking for something because you're in the midst of darkness and you can't find it. God has done this in the midst of human history because of the fall, because of sin. Mankind has been separated from God, but God has been in the midst of a plan to reveal himself by the calling of Abraham, by the production of the nation of Israel, and through Israel giving us Jesus, and then Jesus dying on the cross and ascending to the Father, and then the good news of the gospel being preached that Jesus can save you and that when you believe in your heart and and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died for your sins. So how can we live in the midst of a church where people are unwilling to talk about sin? How can we live in the midst of a church where people are unwilling to talk about the cross? How can we function in a world like that? I mean, you may not ever have to want to really walk into another church again after this. And I I get it. The first couple times I went into a church, I didn't want to go back. It felt weird. But what I'm saying is if you do walk into a church, don't you want to hear the truth? (laughs) According to the way that the Bible is written. According to what God would say. So the day of Pentecost and people are filled with the Holy Spirit to receive power from God to speak forth the truth and in the church age. And this is where we are right now. Many people believe with the rapid change in the world. Do you believe that the world is changing rapidly before our very eyes? I mean, do you believe that? I could sit here and I could talk for another 30 minutes about all the things that I learned just since COVID hit. All the weird stuff. All the different things that people are trying to convince me that it's this and it's that. And I'm just like, dude, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. You want to get woke to something? No, this is ridiculous. Yeah, if you don't believe me, then just come. Like, I don't care what your persuasion is on the shot. I don't really care. I don't care if people don't like me saying it. If you want the shot, take the shot. If you don't want the shot, don't take the shot. But I'm trying to make a point. When patient after patient after patient after patient swabs positive for COVID and they had their booster too. Come on, man. I'm woke to something, but it ain't to what you're making me trying to drink. So that's the point that I'm trying to make. What is it that's going on? I believe there's a lot going on, and I don't know that we're calling it, that we can sit here and say it all today, but look, we're in the time frame of the church, amen? (laughs) And at the end of it, there's going to be a last seven years. We just got off of a big study. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. I'm closing this message this morning. I want you to know as the singers and the musicians come forward and get their stuff ready, they're going to lead us in a song as we close out this service. I want you to know that the altars are always open in this church. I love to pray with people. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, whether you come to the front for prayer or not, what I need you to know is how does a person get saved? Saved from what? That's what somebody you know, as I go out around talking to people about the Lord, what do I need to be saved from? You need to be saved from a devil's hell, my friend. Jesus preached to hell. He said it's a place where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Seeker sensitive church don't work according to the way that the Lord preached. Now, I'm not trying to scare nobody into faith. That doesn't work. It'll hold you for a little bit, but it won't keep you. What you need is a real relationship with Jesus. So how do I get saved? I hear the truth about Jesus and something is stirred on the inside of me. I don't understand it all the time right away, but something is stirred. If you felt something stirring in you, 
then it's likely the Holy Spirit witnessing His truth to you. And He's calling on you to come to Him. The last seven years, there's seven years left, and it's going to be the worst time that humanity has ever faced. And after that, then Jesus is going to rule and reign, and one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. In order for you and I to be able to engage in the plan of God, it starts with giving our heart to Jesus. It starts with us understanding that we were born sinners like Adam. And it starts by understanding that we must be born again. Again, the way that you're born again is that you say yes to Jesus. You say, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the answer for my sin. I'm asking you to come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. I repent of my sin, oh Lord God. Fill me with your spirit. If that's your heart and your prayer this morning, I just want to encourage you. If you want to come forward for prayer, listen, I would love to pray with you. If not, as we sing this song, I'm just praying that you would cry out to the Lord and you would say, Jesus, have your way with me. Let's work.